Hey, everyone. Welcome to this last presentation of the day. Today we'll talk about beer brewing. Who's here for the uh, IoT part? Cool. Any of you attended Seth's talk earlier? About uh, home automation? I'm going to do exactly the opposite. Like, he was all about having a local uh, system. I'm all about the cloud. I don't care about security. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Recently, I came to think about, uh, you know, just thinking about my career, and I was thinking, like, should I invest some time in IoT stuff? Like, there's, is it just a trend, and it's going to go? Um, so I was trying to think a little bit about that, and then I did a little bit of research, and it definitely doesn't seem like a trend that's going to go. Uh, it definitely seems like it's going to stay there. Um, it is estimated that there's somewhere along uh, the lines of 50 billion connected devices at the moment. Um, and estimated about 80 million by 2025. That's a lot of internet connected things. As a matter of fact, I was looking at um, the numbers and I was like thinking, that's about six connected devices per, per person. That's a lot. Um, so then I started thinking, I was like, there's no way I have six internet connected devices at my home. So there's, there's two of us. Uh, there's uh, my, my, my partner and I. And, well, of course, we each have our laptop. I love this screen because it's huge, because um, the font is intended to be small here. Uh, so we have four laptops because we each have our work laptop, and then we have like a family laptop. And uh, we each have our cell phones, of course. We uh, also each have a tablet. Now, some of you might say that those are not IoT things. They're just devices that connect to the internet. OK, well, close enough. But let's, let's just look at like real IoT things. Um, so, of course, I have a thermostat. That's, like, that's an obvious one. I, needed, I did a couple of changes when I bought my new house, and that was like the first thing. I wanted to adjust my, my temperature from everywhere. Uh, I have some connected smoke detectors. Um, I travel a lot. I go to conferences such as this one, and um, it's, it's great. So I know if I, there's a fire at my place. Um, not that I can do anything about it, but I'll know. Um, my television is connected to the internet. That's kind of, kind of common nowadays. My car. I realized the other day, because um, I've, I've been used, I've, I had that car for like two years, and I, I, I use you know, my, my phone to start the, the car, but um, yeah, like it's connected to the internet, which is surprising. Um, got a couple of light bulbs, uh, probably four that I use uh, frequently. Connected plugs, those are very, uh, very common nowadays as well. I use them for Christmas lights outside so I can turn them on and off. I've uh, got a couple of connected speakers, Sonos are amazing. Uh, of course, um, I've got outdoors cameras, um, so one in the front, one in the back. Um, I've got a couple of home assistants. Um, what else? Well, oh, my door locks, of course, they're both uh, connected to the internet. That's very safe. As I said, <laughs> security. <laughs> uh, just, oh, I just redid my bathroom. So I've installed a heated floor uh, controller, and it's, of course, uh, I can control it over Wi Fi. Um, and, you know, while I was there, I also installed a, a shower controller that I can use over Wi-Fi. Um, I guess it could be useful if I'm not at home and there's a fire, which I know by my smoke detector is all, you know, save my bathroom. My vacuum, of course, because uh, we all need an internet-connected vacuum. My cat litter, so I can kind of track my kitties when I'm not at home and know if they're healthy. And, yeah, I realized we <laughs> my toothbrush, yeah. Um, it's not worth the investment, really. <laughs> but hey, my toothbrush is connected to the internet. Um, and of course, I've got a couple of fermenters. So um, yeah, IoT devices, <laughs> you care? Well, I guess I care about it. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot more than six devices at my home, and, and those are only consumer devices. Of course, there's a lot more uh, when you look at industrial um, applications and so on. But, but yeah, so there's a fairly good chance that at some point in your career, you'll have to deal with um, IoT devices. So before I, I go a little bit further along the way, let me introduce myself. So hi, my name is Joel. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is my second Star Trek. I was here in 2019. I was really looking forward to this event. Um, I am based off Ottawa, Canada. Uh, I am French Canadian, so that's the uh, charming little accent that you might notice there. I'm also a developer advocate for MongoDB. Uh, if you ever want to get in touch with me, Twitter is always the best way. So it's Joel with two underscores, Lord. Um, messages are open, um, you know, public tweets are always nice because my bosses know that I'm actually working, so feel free to tweet. And here's the agenda. What are we going to talk about today? 
Well, it's, it's, we'll talk a little bit about IoT uh, and JavaScript. I love JavaScript, and I'll show you how, to, uh, how the two can be used together. Um, it's been a long day. I think we kind of deserve a little break, so I'll talk about something slightly different. I'll talk a little bit about beer brewing as well, because um, that's kind of a passion of mine. Um, who's here for the bre beer brewing part? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll take some time to talk a little bit about that as well. So that'll give you a little break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about sensors and data and, and all of that stuff, all that fun stuff with IoT. So IoT and JavaScript, they're together like pizza and beer. It's just a perfect match, match made in heaven. Um, I love JavaScript. As I said, whenever I can do something with JavaScript, I always try to use it. Um, this is actually a conference uh, where I uh, presented a couple of years ago where I had this little robot that you see there, uh, which is uh, an Arduino, and it's controlled by, uh, it uses JavaScript to uh, control it. And in the back right here, you can see kind of a skeleton. Uh, that's a Kinect sensor that was connected to my laptop. And I built a JavaScript library to detect gestures uh, off my Kinect um, skeleton to be able to control that robot. Um, and all of that was built in JavaScript, because I love JavaScript. So whenever I can use JavaScript, I try to do it. So really, uh, you know, I, I use it on the front end. I use uh, React mostly. Um, I use it on the back end, a big, big user of Node.js uh, databases, of course. Um, you know, I work at MongoDB. So we kind of use the, those um, JavaScript schemas to store the information into the database, and then uh, IoT devices as well. So we can now use that um, there as well. So there's a couple of different ways to use JavaScript on IoT devices. Arduino is a board, probably a lot of you, if you're into IoT, you're probably familiar with that board. It's an open source project. Um, it's a, uh, a board that you can buy, they're dirt cheap. Uh, and uh, you can technically use JavaScript, uh, but not on the board itself. So the controller has to be programmed using C, uh, but then you can still install um, a protocol that will, and you'll be able to communicate from a computer. So that computer will be able to send instructions using JavaScript. And that, it's the same library that um, I'll be showing for the Raspberry Pi, um, so I won't go into too much detail. So know that it is possible, but you kind of need another computer or a Raspberry Pi on top of it to be able to control your Arduino. The one microcontroller that I've recently discovered and I really, really like is the Esprino, uh, which is a tiny microcontroller which is programmable in JavaScript. Or the Raspberry Pi is also another one that can be used. It's, of course, it's a full computer, so you can use JavaScript on it uh, if you'd like to. So Esprino looks a little bit like this. I have one right here with me. I'll show it in a couple of seconds. Uh, so this is from their website. So Esprino Wi-Fi is a tiny USB and Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller that can be programmed in JavaScript. Just plug it into your computer and get started in seconds with the web ID. No software installation needed. I love that marketing spiel. <laughs> uh, so the Esprino looks a little bit like this. Um, there's more information there. This is the website. So you can go to esprino.com slash ID and you get the ID. Uh, it uses web USB, so you can actually connect it, and you have access through the serial port to the microcontroller. You use some JavaScript, and you just push the, or flash the code to your microcontroller, and you're done. Like, it just works, and you can use JavaScript directly. I do have a version of the IDE right here. Um, and this is some code. So as you can see, uh, this is very standard JavaScript code, um, and the hello world of anything um, IoT or uh, hardware related is always a blinking LED. So the first thing you'll want to do is to uh, get a LED and make it blink. Uh, so this is the code that you would need for uh, this tiny microcontroller. So uh, I'm setting uh, a state to false, and then I just use an interval, uh, and then I write the status to the LED, and I also use console log, because if you need to debug, well, we all know that that's the way to debug in JavaScript, right? Console log. So if I try to connect to my little device here, might work. Now, of course, I'm, I'll be relying on the internet, <laughs> which is a very bad decision, um, but we'll see how that works eventually. All right, so this is the uh, actual controller. Let me just flash the code here, and I've got it right here. And, oh, oops, this way. There, it's, it's. <laughs> so it is tiny, tiny. Um, but yeah, so th there you got it. Uh, so it looks a little bit like this, um, and there's a LED. There's two LEDs built on, uh, so you can actually use those. Uh, now it's flashing, uh, and then I also added a tiny little controller or a sensor here. Um, that little sensor is a temperature and humidity sensor. So um, if you want to um, do little things, um, 
those require a little bit more code, but we can take a look at it. Um, okay, on, off, on, off. All right, that's a bit annoying. Um, so this is the code that I had to, um, and this one will actually rely on Wi-Fi. Such a bad decision. Um, so uh, using the DHT, and there's a bunch of different libraries that you can use. Uh, so they, they, uh, they have a, a very uh, large ecosystem of libraries that you can use to connect to different sensors. This specific sensor, the blue one, uh, is called a DHT11. Uh, so just require the library DHT11. Required a Wi-Fi library. What I'll do here is that I'll uh, turn off my two LEDs. Um, then I'll connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, I'll link a little bit the, uh, the first ledge just to tell me that it is connected or not, so I'm, I'm kind of getting visual cues here. Um, and then I'll uh, just use a set interval and try to get the temperature every five seconds. So the get temperature just uses that DHT library that I've just required, um, and then I get the temperature. Um, it's a buffer, so I convert that into a string, and then I send that data, and the send data function um, will just send that data to an endpoint, to an HTTPS endpoint, um, and, and then we forget about it, an HTTP endpoint, actually. All right, so let's try to flash this one. Oh, yeah, we're off for a good start. All right. Everything else fails. Did I move something earlier? Module not found. Why, why did you find it earlier, but not anymore? All right. When everything else fails, unplug, disconnect, replug, reconnect, web serial, SMT32. I mean, I'm expecting the demo to fail anyways, but just not in that way. <laughs> All right, let's try to flash it again, and let's just forget about it. Um, but essentially what it does, um, and as I said, like I was pretty much expecting it wouldn't work anyways, just because um, internet connection is not perfect here. Um, <laughs> that one really bugs me. Uh, it might have to do with internet, actually. Uh, but essentially what it does is that it just takes a temperature and just sends that uh, to an HTTP endpoint every five seconds. I will actually go back to that later on, and we'll see the results of it um, in a database. Uh, so the Esprino, this is the code that you would use. Uh, like I said, I've already shown you this code. Uh, so bury your classic JavaScript so you can really use that on uh, the Esprino. Raspberry Pi is slightly different. Raspberry Pi is not a microcontroller. It's actually a tiny dual display desktop computer and robot brains, smart home hub, media center, network, AI, core, factory. I don't even know what those means. Um, but also from the website, I love the marketing stuff. Um, so yeah, so it's a tiny computer, that's what it is, uh, and there's a full operating system, and you've got access to a bunch of different pins uh, or that you can use to connect sensors to it. Because it's a computer, you can use either Python or uh, JavaScript or whatever language that you're comfortable with to actually have access to those pins and do things with it. Um, so it can be useful in certain cases. I like to use it with Johnny5. Uh, if, uh, uh, if you want to build uh, DIY uh, IoT stuff, Johnny5 is an amazing library. So just run npm install, uh, install Johnny5, and this is the code. So it's an event-driven library. Uh, so just require the library, uh, require Raspi IO in this case. Uh, if you want to use it with our, an Arduino board, you don't need that uh, specific line. Initialize your board and you've got a ready event, and then you can do different things, such as blinking a LED. So just declare a new LED, and then blink that LED. So very straightforward to use. Um, library, and on, uh, on top of that, they've got like the best documentation ever. They've got an amazing documentation. Not only do they give you like the code snippets to just about any sensor that you can think about, but they also provide you with all the schematics. So you don't need to know anything about electronics. They already give all of that to you. So that can also be very, very useful. So, which one should you use? An Esprino, Raspberry Pi? Um, it really depends on your use cases. Uh, I mean, the Esprino is dirt cheap. Um, like, it, it's, uh, I think they go for like five or $10 nowadays. Um, so they're really, really cheap. They connect directly to the Wi-Fi, uh, but they're really, really dumb. So there's not much that you can do with it. Uh, the one that I had here um, can't even use a HTTPS connection because um, you know, the protocol is, is too large to fit on the microcontroller. So I'm actually using an HTTP endpoint that just sends information back to an HTTPS endpoint. Um, so not very secure either, although the latest versions do support uh, HTTPS now. Um, if you want to go down that route, uh, it, 
might make some sense to use a protocol such as uh, Zigbee or Z-Wave. They're a little bit smaller, uh, but if you want to use the Wi-Fi, um, you know, it, it's, it already takes a lot of space, so you'll have to keep your devices very dumb. Uh, but they're very useful for sensors, so if you want to just get some data from a room, from a sensor like this, what's the temperature, and just send that to the cloud, it makes perfect sense to use those Esprino because they'll just, they'll just do that, and they'll be very reliable, they use very low energy, and they'll just send that information to the cloud. On the other hand, if you need something a little bit more complex, if you want to build a full hub, then you'll need to rely on Raspberry Pi because you'll need um, a lot more power, you'll need more processing power, you'll probably need to have a full uh, hub to control your devices, um, such as um, Home Assistant. That was introduced in a, in a talk earlier today. So that's kind of where you'll, you'll do the distinction. So if you want to make a little bit more processing, you'll have to use a Raspberry Pi. All right, let's take a little break. Well, I didn't bring some for everyone, but um, I, I do have a couple of spares, so, because you asked. <laughs> You're in charge of passing them around, though. Sorry, I have to stick to this box. All right. Those in rooms 24, 25, 26 will be like, oh, damn, I should have been there earlier. Ah, all right, so let's take a little break. This is usually the part of the talk where I'm a little bit more relaxed. Go figure. Let's talk about beer. All right, you gotta be 18 years of old uh, or older to attend to this talk. Um, that's the legal age in Quebec, I don't know. It's good enough if you're 18. Um, I'm in no way encouraging the abuse of alcoholic beverages. I think it's, in, it's very important to mention. Um, I do realize the irony of that when I just cracked open a beer in the middle of the afternoon, but, um, but not everybody has the same relationship with alcohol, and I think it's important to mention that. Um, I'm not encouraging the abuse, but I'm passionate about brewing. I really, really love the brewing process, um, and, well, the drinking part is kind of a byproduct. <laughs> I kind of have to. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about definition, making sure everybody's on the same page, everybody knows what beer is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ingredients that you need. We'll talk about the process to make it, and then um, the, uh, the end product. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm based in Gatineau, Quebec, so I'm technically not Ottawa, Ottawa. Uh, and I'm master brewer and co-founder of Brain Brew Canada. Uh, don't look for our products in store, though. That's pretty much our setup. Uh, <laughs> That's actually our experimental setup. So it's not like the real setup that we use. Uh, those are uh, to make some five gallon batches. This is what we typically use. We do about 20 gallon batches uh, when, whenever we brew. Uh, this was a, a long day. We brewed two batches, so 40 gallons that day. Uh, so that big kettle that you see in the middle is a 50 gallon kettle. And it's funny how <laughs> beer brewers are super excited about kettles. It's like, look at it, look at it. Uh, all right. Uh, but yeah, if you're ever, if you're ever by my place, uh, you know, feel free to uh, drop by for a cold one. Let's talk about the history of beer. All right, so just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what is beer? Beer is a beverage elaborated from cereal grains. Uh, there's a fermentation process, and it will uh, produce alcohol between 4.1 and 5.5%. That's the legal definition in Canada. Um, less than that is light beer, and more than that is just strong beer. So let's talk about the history of beer. Um, the earliest evidence of beer brewing that uh, archaeologists have been able to found dates about 11,000 BC, um, so somewhere near Israel. 11,500 BC, uh, they found some, some uh, pre-pottery Neolithic, um, they, they found some evidence that beer was produced uh, near Turkey. Um, then uh, 3,500 BC is the first evidence of using barley, so the more modern ingredients, so that's like the original recipe. Um, they, they found some, some evidence of, um, of vessels that were used to produce that beer. And of course, there were some beard nerds that tried to get the yeast out of those to try to make some beer with it. Um, <laughs> apparently it worked. Um, and, and that leads us to 2016, which is the uh, creation of beer, Brain Brew. So nothing really important between the two of those. Uh, recipes hasn't changed that much since. So let's talk about the ingredients. So I've talked about recipes. Well, the first ingredient, first and foremost, is water. Hence, beer is healthy. Uh, 
95% of the end product is water. Uh, the pH should be uh, between 5.2 and 5.6, so you should try to balance your water when you start brewing. Uh, try to reduce the chlorine as well. There's a couple of uh, chemistry that you can do, uh, but tap water is perfectly fine. That's usually what I use. Then you need some grains, malted grains. So uh, those are grains that are germinated and then they dry those. And that produces a little bit of sugar. Uh, and then they roast those uh, at different temperatures. And the temperature to which they, they, be, they will be roasted will produce different colors. And those colors will affect the uh, final color of the beer. So the uh, starches from those grains will become the fermented, fermentable sugars. So I was wrong, it's, it's not producing uh, sugars. Uh, when it's germinated and dried, it pr actually produces starches. And those starches will become our fermentable sugars. Now, a lot of people, when you think of a porter, you think of a very dark beer, right? Um, and you think uh, that you know, the grains would all be very dark. This is actually what a grain bill for a porter looks like. So those tiny little speckles of black in there are actually enough to produce a very, very dark colored beer. So this is my recipe for a porter. We've got about 76% base grain, which is just uh, roasted barley, so that's what you see mostly on this picture. We've got a little bit of wheat uh, as well. Uh, wheat carries the flavors a little bit more, so uh, it'll give it a little bit more sweetness. Uh, Crystal 75 um, adds a little bit of sweetness as well. Then we've got chocolate melt, which is just a trademark. Uh, has nothing to do with chocolate, but that's the dark speckles there. And carapils is a malted grain that is used to help with foaming a little bit. So it helps to make a nice foam on top of your beer. If you compare that to my recipe for an IPA, you've got about 88% uh, uh, base grain, a little bit of crystal, slightly less colored in this case, and 4% of that carapils. So you can see that the recipes are very, very similar. So it just takes tiny, tiny little adjustments to produce something very, very dark, such as a porter or a much more blonder beer. This is the Lovey Bond scale, which is used to, so when I mentioned Crystal 75, it's somewhere at the bottom right here, so that's uh, just a color scale. 40 is a little bit higher, uh, so you can kind of see it somewhere around here. So just a way to uh, figure out the, the color of your grains. All right, and then we need hops. Hops is, hops is a recent addition to the process, 822 AD, um, and it's been really used lately um, in the last couple of years, maybe overused a little bit at times. Um, it's, res <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's responsible for the flavoring of the beer, uh, also the, the bitter, bitterness of the beer. Um, but that bitterness is really important. It really contributes to the sweetness of the mouth. Uh, it, when you do your, your mash, you, you prepare your wort, um, and if you taste it, it's very, very sweet. Like um, the, the kids, whenever uh, they're at home, uh, the grandkids, when they're, they're at home, they, they like to taste it because it's very, very, very sweet. Um, but it, it would be too sweet to drink uh, alone, so you want to add a little bit of bitterness to kind of balance that. A lot of different hops that you can use are a lot of varieties, um, and they each have very, very different and distinct flavor profiles. Um, so uh, what is commonly used uh, in the U.S. is citra, uh, very, very often used in IPAs um, and dry hops, uh, which is very citrusy. Uh, Chinook, very, very used in, uh, often used in Canada, very piney, a little bit more stronger. Uh, so there's a bunch of different yeast that you can, uh, not yeast, hops that you can use. Finally, we've got yeast. Yeast is the, where the magic happens. I am fascinated by yeast. I, I, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, it really influences the character and the flavor of the beer. We often tend to neglect it, uh, but it can really, really change the end result. Um, it can be cultivated or it can be found in nature. Uh, I've actually brewed a, a batch where, you know, you just take your kettle, put it outside, wait a couple of days, and then you just bring it inside and magically it just starts to, uh, to ferment because there's some of those little yeast that are just everywhere. Uh, finally, what, the, what is the process? Uh, well, how do you make beer? You've, got, we, you've seen the setup already. Uh, so we've got three kettles. We've got uh, the hot liquor tank, we've got a mash tun, and we've got a boil kettle. So the first step is to do that mash. So you wanna put some hot water on the grains and that will really produce those sugars that you want for the fermentation process. Uh, and then you recirculate a little bit. Um, that's actually not recirculation, it should be back into the mash tun. Um, and that will produce a nice wort. It'll filter out any, um, any particles that you might have in there uh, because the grains act as a natural filter. And you boil that about 60 minutes. Uh, that's when you'll start adding your hops. Um, the earlier you will put the hops in, the, the bitter they will be. So uh, if you want to do like a, a very strong a West Coast IPA, you'll add a ton of hops right at the beginning of the boil process, and it'll be really, really bitter. 
uh, but you could also do a steeping step. So those uh, New England IPAs type of thing, uh, they'll, they'll lower the temperature just a little bit, put in the hops at the end, uh, and it won't have that bitterness. bitterness. Next, you need to chill. Um, you, chill, you need to chill your, your wort. Um, that's an interesting thing because all, if you've noticed, all the other temperatures were in Fahrenheit. Um, this one is in Celsius. There's like one thing with Canadian and temperature where some things like cooking is always in Fahrenheit, but other things like room temperature is in Celsius. So I have no clue what 20 Celsius is in Fahrenheit, but anyways. Uh, you do that with cold water, that's a ch plate chiller, so it'll just send uh, cold water in one direction, the wort, hot wort in the other direction, and it comes out, uh, com comes out cold. This is another type of chiller that you can use, or you know, just do it the Canadian way, uh, brew outside in winter, and it'll chill quickly. And then finally, you've got the fermentation process. This is where you'll add yeast. Like I said, I love yeast. I, I think it's like just a fascinating process. Uh, just like everyone else during COVID, I started doing my own sourdough, um, and it's exactly that same process. It's, it's just a yeast uh, that will produce, uh, produce both uh, yeast and the sugar will produce ethanol and CO2. So I, I just, I don't know, it's so cool. Like there's those little bacteria that'll just go eat the sugar and just fart in your beer and produces alcohol. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, it's really cool. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so you can let the magic happen. Uh, and and the, the process itself, like it's very active. You see it, like it just comes to life. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm really passionate about it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, you can see uh, in the, on that picture on the left uh, where it kind of moves there. Uh, the one on the right, and you don't really see it there, but uh, there is so much activity in it that it just popped the cap off. Uh, and it made quite a mess. <laughs> Um, but I kind of expected that from that yeast, so like it was, it was already in my shower, so it's not too bad. Um, so now you'll want to calculate the amount of alcohol that you have in the end product, right? So in order to do that, you'll actually have to measure the sugars before the process and at the end of the process. There are ways to calculate how much alcohol you've got, but it's very complicated. Uh, so the easiest way is really to calculate the difference in sugars, and then you know uh, through some, a little bit of maths how much um, alcohol was produced. Oh yeah, my, my cats also love that part. Uh, as I said, the word is very, very sweet, so whenever I put my fermenters, if there's a little bit of drips that came out, um, they'll just go crazy. So in order to calculate how much sugar you've got inside of your, um, inside of your wort, you'll wanna check the water density. So the more sugar there is, the denser the water will be. Uh, this is a fun experiment that you can do with kids uh, if you're interested. You just color some water, uh, add more sugars in, in, in some of them, and then you can kind of layer those different uh, water, colored waters on top of each other. That's because the denser the water, uh, you know, the, the, the more sweet the water, the denser it will be. You can also use a refractometer to measure that. That's uh, the, the tool, so you can just uh, put a drop in it and you can see what is the current, uh, current amount of sugars in it. So you check that at the beginning, at the end of the process. Or you can use uh, something like this, but I'll come back to that later. All right, and then we keg the beer. Uh, so we're almost done. Just put everything inside some of the kegs, put that in the fridge, wait a couple of days, uh, add a little bit of uh, uh, CO2, and we've got an end product. Um, so that's, those are our, our little bottles. Uh, so cool, so sante, whew. All right, so that was for our little break. Where's this guy going with all of this beer stuff? Um, well, <laughs> let me link back to our presentation and let's just go back to that slide. So I, start, I talked about that little device that I use here um, and it's, uh, it's an open source project, it's called the iSpindle and it, what it has, it's uh, an ESP8266, so same thing as the Esprino, it's connected to the uh, internet through Wi-Fi um, and it has an accelerometer in it. Um, I actually have it right here, uh, if I just can put this in. Um, so it's, I mean, it's not that impressive, uh, but you've got the same uh, Esprino, no, nope, on the other hand, uh, the Esprino chipset right there, and a battery uh, on, uh, behind it. Uh, and it has an accelerometer on it, so you can, and, and uh, gravity is an acceleration towards, uh, you know, the floor. Uh, so if, the, uh, if it's more tilted, you can see a difference, and then using some uh, basic trigonometry, you can calculate the angle of the device. Based on that angle, you can calibrate it and then detect what is the density of the water. So it has been built on an ASP8266. It has accelerometer temperature sensor. Um, and the only thing that it does really, um, again, it's a really, really dumb device. It'll just take the angle, take the temperature, send that to the cloud, and that's it. 
Uh, it'll go to sleep between, uh, between readings, so it'll uh, wake up every hour for, and the battery will last about three months uh, when it wakes up about once an hour. But then what? All right, so I've got this data coming in, um, and, and that's the thing. With IoT devices, it's all about the data. Uh, the devices themselves, well, they don't do anything. It just reads, it just reads an angle. Uh, so what can I do with that? So when you start thinking about IoT, you'll, you'll want to start thinking about a little bit um, how you're going to process all of that information. And as I've mentioned earlier, there was a, a talk this morning about uh, using everything locally and never trying to send anything to the cloud. Um, I'm going to say the exact opposite. You want to send everything to the cloud. Uh, you'll want to be able to process it, do some analytics on it. Um, that is assuming that you want to be that evil person that just collects the data. So you'll have your devices, some sensors. You'll need some sort of an internet gateway. So if the protocol that you use um, with your IoT devices is Zigbee or Z-Wave, you will still need some sort of um, a device that will be, uh, be able to connect to the internet and then send that information um, to the cloud. Uh, a lot of industrial applications will uh, use a lot of edge processing, so they'll try to detect anomalies as soon as they can. Uh, so right at the edge of the cloud, they'll try to do some analytics, and then you've got your cloud where you can process data, store it for the longer term, uh, longer term analysis as well, so to produce um, some sort of uh, visualizations and so on. So this is my architecture for my two fermenters. So they're connected to the internet directly through the home router, so they're using the Wi-Fi chip. Uh, and then I use some Realm functions, so some serverless functions to create those HTTPS endpoints so I can send the information and save that into my database. Once inside, it's inside my database, I can use uh, triggers, I can use aggregation pipelines to extract, do some analytics on it, and then I can use uh, charts to produce uh, nice visualizations. So this is what uh, the serverless functions look like. Uh, I'm, you could use any uh, serverless function, of course, uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda is probably the most popular one. Uh, for this specific case, I've used um, MongoDB's uh, own serverless uh, infrastructure, which is part of uh, now called the Atlas Application Services. Uh, so basically what I do here is that I create my function. You can set up a bunch of different security features, uh, specify what, what do you want to give it access to or not, and then you've got a function, which is just some plain old JavaScript where you can uh, write whatever information that you want to, whatever, uh, server, whatever function that you want to. The reason why I use MongoDB in this case is that I want to connect to my database, and it just makes it very, very easy. I can just uh, get that context, and uh, I have access to my uh, Atlas uh, database. So what I do here is that I take all the arguments that were sent to that function, I just add a received at a field with the uh, current timestamp, and then I just save that to the database. So again, that function is pretty dumb, so the only thing I do is just save that information. And then I can create some endpoints. You can see here that I'm creating a post endpoint. Um, it should actually toggle on respond with results. Then I can specify, again, security features and on and on and on. And then I just deploy all of that. And I've got an HTTPS endpoint, uh, which will uh, trigger that function that I've just created. So I've got my curl command right here. I can just take that curl, paste that into my terminal, and it just works. So I've just sent a foobar to, the, to that function. And you can see that uh, it returned all the, all the records inside the database, so not a very smart function here. Uh, not very secure either. Uh, but you can kind of see the records that were created uh, where they just have foobar, um, and they've got to receive that, the timestamp, um, and they've got all the information about the request as well, because I just took that information and just saved all of it inside my database. So now I have the information inside my database. So what do I want to do with that? Um, first of all, I'm using time series here. Uh, that's very important. If you start playing around with IoT devices, you'll want to use time series. Uh, what a time series is, is basically, uh, this is actually a, like a, a regular uh, collection where you save information into a database and it just saves the information, whatever, one, one, uh, one after the other, just um, in no particular order, just in the order that it, it comes in. Um, what that ends up doing is that all the information is spread across different blocks on the disk. It's um, spread apart in different places in the database. So it's a little bit hard to, for databases to track all that information. So if you want all the information about the red sensor, well, it kind of has to go through a bunch of different places to actually find all the specific data points for that um, red sensor. So what do you want to do instead? Um, and that's what time series databases will do, is that they'll uh, store information about a specific object all together. So there's a, a proximity inside a data, 
So they're close together on disks, and it's much, much easier for the database to find those, uh, those pieces of data. Um, if you're using MongoDB, uh, it's just a flag that you put on your collection, and you can use the database exactly as if it was any regular database. Um, and most databases abstract all of that part for you, so you don't really have to think about it. Uh, but it really stores information like this, and it saves up, uh, saves up to 70-something uh, 70, 70 percent of disk space, um, and it does increase the speed a lot when you try to access that data. All right, so now I've got the information inside my database, inside my time series collection. What I'll do is try to do some, um, some analytics on it. I'll try to extract some information, so I'll want to... Uh, you know, find different averages. I'll want to find an average over uh, a couple of days or, or process different, um, different uh, process my data to try to get some, some insights on what's going on. So what I'm doing here is that's my database for the uh, Esprino just sending the temperature. Um, I can sort it. I can see that information. Um, so I can use um, aggregation pipelines to really create a pipeline of different steps that I want to do. So the first thing that I want to do is to extract all the fields that uh, are not minus one, because uh, if something goes wrong, it sends minus one to the cloud. Then I'll want to um, sort that by the uh, received at timestamp. Uh, then I'll add a limit. I just want the last record in this case. So you can see that I've got all of those fields. Now, temperature and humidity, um, I send those as strings because I was converting from a buffer. And like I said, I want to keep my devices stupid, so I just send those strings but now I want to convert those fields into uh, actual integers so I can manipulate those. Um, so you can do that uh, conversion as well. So you get to create those uh, nice little pipelines uh, which will produce the uh, result that you want at the end. And then you can just export that into uh, your code. Oh, also, you don't want to send the full object, which is the last step right here. So I'm just sending just the temperature, just the, humi the humidity, and the I uh, received that timestamp. And then you export the code. All right, so this is what you get. This is the uh, end result of that aggregation pipeline, so you can kind of see all of those different steps. So I can use that and just get that last field. Now that you've got uh, this, you can store that as part of uh, a new function, store that into uh, an aggregation pipeline, or uh, store that into a serverless function, and store that onto an HTTPS endpoint. Um, and now that you've got that, you can actually fetch that information and just put it in your uh, React application, which is the case for uh, this slide deck. Now, this is, um, oh, the other thing that you can do is actually watch for changes. So instead of just fetching the information because you don't want to pull all the time, um, you can just uh, watch for changes um, using a change stream. So this is the last time that it actually works, so somewhere around noon. Uh, so you can see that I fetched the information from the database, just got those 22 degrees, 51% humidity, um, and they received that. So that's the, the um, record that I got from that aggregation pipeline. Uh, so I just did a fetch here. And in theory, uh, it's not listening for changes, so uh, if it, there would be internet, it would actually update. All right, so I'm almost done. Uh, I needed to add a couple of more things uh, to my application. One of the things that I wanted to, because um, I'm lazy, uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, I, I send myself a text message whenever the beer is ready, because, um, you know, why not? If I've got an internet connected fermenter, might as well make it useful. I guess I could just go out and look at the fermenter and look at the readings, but uh, way more fun to have it by uh, text message. So what I've used here is a trigger, so it uses pretty much the same thing. Uh, I, once again, I just use a function, I create my function, and then I, I create a new trigger. I just tell it whenever uh, you, you've got a, a new entry in the database, I uh, just run this, so I'm just naming it, um, on this specific database, on this specific collection. And then whenever there's a new insert, just trigger a specific function, which is that function right here, which I'll write right now. Um, this function will actually send an SMS message. So whenever there's a new record, it will um, just send an SMS. Uh, this one uses the uh, Twilio context. So there's a bunch of different services that you can use here. Uh, so it will just use that Twilio context and then just use the uh, send method and it will just send that message whenever there's a new record. Uh, so that can be quite annoying when I do presentations and it sends a new message every five seconds, uh, but it's kind of fun. All right, and finally, um, you know, I wanted a way to kind of visualize that data. Um, it's, it's no fun if you just got the information inside of a database, you want to show it off to the world. Um, so I've used charts for that specific last part. Um, so once again, um, part of the Atlas um, infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of BI tools that you can use. Uh, Tableau is an amazing one as well. 
uh, that you can connect and get that information. Uh, this one just connects directly to the Mongo database. And you can see here in that specific chart I had, uh, there's a little anomaly. Um, I've, I've turned it on a little bit earlier. Uh, so you can kind of reduce the, the different dates, specify the new range, and then you can get, uh, adjust uh, your, your charts. Um, one of the other readings that I have is the battery level. Uh, so it just tells me the voltage in the battery. So I know if, there's a, if my battery is still good, so I can kind of add this new line to my chart. Um, and I've got uh, all of those charts that are produced for me. Now those charts uh, can be uh, embedded into my website. So this is, this is our official website. Because um, yes, of course, the first thing that we did when we started brewing was to buy a domain name, uh, just like any other tech project. Uh, and we can see what's brewing. And we've got those that are connected. Uh, fortunately, I haven't brewed a lot lately, <laughs> now that I've started traveling again. Uh, but you can kind of see those charts uh, on, directly uh, live on the website. Uh, unfortunately, they date back to uh, October. Uh, this one dates back to December. That was my Christmas beer. Great beer, by the way. I uh, brewed with like ma uh, maple syrup and really, really good. Uh, <laughs> so there's very interesting things that I can now get from that, from that. Now I can see what's happening inside of my fermenter. And like I said, when you start that fermentation process and it really goes live and you can see all of those uh, things moving inside of your fermenters, there's that big steep and there's this huge drop in the sugar levels and it just goes, and it goes really quickly actually, it's surprisingly fast. It takes two to three days I mean, regular batches of beer where you've got that steep drop in sugar levels and then it kind of stabilizes until uh, it gets to almost zero sugars at the end. One thing that I didn't know, uh, but I know because you know, I've added a sensor inside of my fermenters is that there's a huge um, peak in temperature as well. So as I start brewing, or as the, the fermentation process starts, uh, you can really see in the blue line here that uh, peak uh, from the, the, that the temperature rises inside of that fermenter. So I tried to convince my girlfriend that uh, this is uh, good because we can kind of heat the house with the fermentation process. Uh, and you can see also that that batch was brewed during winter, so there's a lot of, uh, it gets really colder at night. All right, so that was a lot of stuff, a lot of content that I've covered. Um, and uh, just a quick recap, so I've talked a little bit about um, IoT, JavaScript, how you can use IoT uh, with, uh, how you can use JavaScript with IoT, how you can program microcontrollers now using JavaScript. Um, I've talked about a couple of different sensors. Uh, you can come and talk to me afterwards. I've got, well, one at least here. Uh, I talked a little bit about beer brewing basics, so hopefully you all learned something about that. Uh, I talked about sensors and data, how you can manipulate that data, that, which is really the critical part when you're dealing with IoT. You'll want to make sure that you can process all of that data. Um, so that's, uh, that was the last part there. If you want to learn more about MongoDB, I have to plug this. <laughs> so we've got our flagship event coming next month uh, in New York City. Um, so, and you've got a promo code if you want a 25% off, uh, or just come talk to me afterwards. And that is all I had, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope you've learned a thing or two, and if you want more information, the slides, everything is there. Thank you. And we've got a couple of more minutes for questions, if any. In the room first, I've got one right. How much money did it cost to uh, make the sensors? Uh, how much did it cost for those sensors? Um, I think probably $40. Give or take a couple of dollars. Yes? Um, how do you sanitize the sensor? Is there anything that touches the beer has to be sanitized? Absolutely. I see you're an experienced brewer. So everything that touches the beer needs to be sanitized. It's very important. Um, but it's, uh, it's a waterproof case. Um, so I just, oh, okay. yeah. So I, so I just put some sanitizer on it and then drop it. Uh, but you're, you're correct. You have to make sure everything is sanitized. You had a question? How to, <laughs> how to convince your significant other that you can use your shower to put your fermenters in. <laughs> My significant other is a flight attendant, and she tends to leave for like four days. <laughs> That's usually when I start brewing. Um, and it takes two or three days to make that mess, and then I can move them elsewhere. Um, but we do have two showers, so you know, I, I still shower during those couple of days, just so we're clear. Any other questions in the room? Yes? What's your favorite style of beer? It's my favorite style of beer. All of them. Um, 
Yeah, it's, they're, they're all very different. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like your favorite, ki your favorite kid, right? You can't really pick one. Uh, it would be unfair for the others. Um, although, you know, always, I always secret, secretly have a favorite one. But um, no, I, I usually, I, I always enjoy local beers. Uh, so this is from Columbus Brewing Company. Um, so I always try to pick a, a local one when I, when I travel, but uh, no favorite. <laughs> Want Slack? How did the wild yeast batch turn out? It turned out to be amazing. Um, it creates a very particular uh, taste. Um, you have to be really careful when you're doing that, though, because uh, you will uh, introduce bacteria inside the process. Ultimately, uh, the alcohol will kill the bacteria, but you've got to wait a long time to make sure that you've got enough alcohol in there to kill the bacteria. Um, but yeah, but it, it, was, it was interesting. It's a, a little bit of a funky taste. Um, you might have heard of... Um, there's, there's some wild yeast beers that are available and nowadays in, in craft breweries as well. So uh, I'm trying to think of the name. I just, anyways, yeah. Other questions? Anything about the tech? <laughs> <laughs> Was that a question? No, okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I hope you'll have a good movie. I'll stick around if you have uh, specific questions and just come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you.